but the five years I've been up here, they've been involved in it, and the beacons and all that kind of stuff. They were very instrumental in lots of things, like the, the big sign, the big uh, uh, evergreen sign from uh, Vancouver, from the field there, and in moving the beacon and all kinds of things. And they're pilots, and they're experts on this, uh, uh, on these uh, airway beacons across the country. And it's interesting because there's a man in uh, Walnut Creek named Tom Johnson who's doing a bunch of studies. And I kind of thought he was the expert on, he's been all the way across the country. But I had a nice email from him. He says, well, be sure and tell Chris Parks hello. And he's the real expert on all these things. The man I think is the expert thinks Chris Parks is the expert. So with that, I'll let you guys talk to him. Our expert. Thank you, Judy. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. This is a, uh, a quick story about the beacon number four that we have up front and the airmail system as we know it or knew it. The usual horse-drawn wagon foot or horseback. So the postal system was really moving along coast to coast now by train after the Pony Express existed. This is how they got there. This is how they're still doing a lot today. That's some of the equipment and some of the feet that were moving the mail back in the early 1900s is where these pictures came from. These gentlemen here are the first managers of the postal system that were involved and interested in aviation flying the mail, air mail. <coughs> these are the guys that helped put it together, managed it, coordinated it, got it approved by Congress and started the process going. The gentleman on the far right is our first private pilot, William McCracken. He's a very licensed, they called it licenses back in those days, not certificates. License number one of the private pilot world, Mr. McCracken. Our first flight in the air mail happened May 15, 1918. Lieutenant George Boyle leaving the polo grounds of Washington, D.C along with another army soldier in a jetty similar to this and similar to the one we have in the, in the main hangar. If you haven't seen it, go out and take a look at it. We had one leaving New York, a stop in Pennsylvania, one leaving the polo grounds here, Lieutenant Boyle, a stop in Pe Pennsylvania, and then on to each other's destination to prove out the point that these old rickety jetties could haul the mail and we could get it done on a, on a daily basis. Lieutenant Boyle was new. He was selected either through some situation. He was young in the business, young Army lieutenant. But he did not have a good sense of direction. <laughs> lieutenant Boyle took off and somehow was told to follow the river up north, but turned right and ended up southeast of Maryland and landed the plane there and broke a prop and he had to get the prop repaired and the airplane was flown back to the polo grounds, empty. Whereas his co-part leaving New York did make it all the way through the system so the mail could be delivered. The system and the group of the managers gave Lieutenant Boyle another chance and they took him up with a load of mail and another Jenny flying with him, an instructor pilot, and flew alongside him to follow the river but that instructor pilot airplane fell into an engine issue and had to peel away. And Lieutenant Boyle, with his directional problem, ended up flying more towards Virginia and the ocean and eventually put the plane in the ocean because it ran out of fuel. <laughs> so he did not make it that day either. But you can rotate that frame. This is the actual takeoff of Lieutenant Boyle the first time. His co-part, his cohort, did make it both times, and hence the headline on May 16th that we could get the first day on mail moved along. And that helped start the ensuing kind of working And by 1923, five years after that, this is the airway structure that was in place by that time. You'll notice it's unlit at this time. It was only done during the day. And the train system was doing it during the night. So these guys were delivering the airmail on this route structure by 1923 on a fairly regular basis during the day. Aircraft didn't have any lights at that time, didn't have any decent navigational situations. So it's important to know that they 
would fly what we call VFR in the pilot world. Visual flight rules. You had to see what you were doing. Even then, they pushed it. And once they were up, if they had fog or if they had terrain and they didn't know what they were doing, they would crash in that situation. They were so, the managers and the group in the Postal Service and even Congress wanted this to go so badly that they wanted to continue trying to get this going even at night. Congress is going to pull the funding if they didn't get this thing going at night. Again, they were flying during the day as far as they could. They would land at dusk or dark. They would unload these airplanes. They would load the mail onto a train, closest train, and the train would haul it as far as they could that night. And some airplane would pick it up again during the day and keep moving. In 1927, they took four gentlemen, two from New York, two from San Francisco, and they were to meet in Chicago, and they flew these routes at night with mail to, to prove to everybody that they could fly these missions at night. Again, these are old aircraft. These are the Havilands, standards, airplanes that didn't have any real lights, didn't have any real navigation, wet compasses, watches, altimeters, airspeed indicators. That's about it. Engine gauges, of course. When they left that night, the storm was brewing in the Midwest, around Chicago, snowing, ugly, cold. The first airplane leaving New York had an engine problem, basically turned around and stayed in New York. The second airplane leaving New York also moved on a little bit closer to Chicago, didn't have much of a routine luck that night either, had to put it down in a field on the way. From the west side, Jack Knight, and another pilot both left. His partner had a problem, had to put it down in Nebraska somewhere. But Jack Knight, with coordination through the Postal Service, they had farmers and postal workers who built bonfires. Every five or 10 miles or whatever it took to have the visuals so that a guy like this could fly in the dark in bad weather and find the next bonfire visually and keep following that bonfire all the way to Chicago. And he did it. And it was amazing, and it was luck, and it was just tough going. But he established that you could fly at night if you have a direction, a, a guide, a light. The bonfires are what started it. And when we moved into the, the, the business of light beacons and blinkers, and systems like that to help guide these guys across the country. Jack Knight eventually became a United Airlines pilot and retired with United Airlines after a very good career. So he, he made it through this. By the end of 1927, the same year that Jack Knight established he could fly across the country at night, this is what the air route structure looked like all the way to San Francisco. Anything with two lines on it were the lighted portions and anything with a single line, no lights at all at night as yet, but they still had a root structure established. As you'll notice, the Portland route up to Spokane doesn't exist yet. Our root structure here, and what we call the contract airmail route number five between Portland and Spokane, didn't get complete until 1930. And this is what it looked like in 31. The weather was so bad, I'm reading in my research, in the late 1930, September, October, actually even August, the weather was extremely bad here in the gorge. They couldn't get this product done. They were building structures on these cliff tops, and I've been on these places that we're going to talk about. And some of these are hundreds of feet above the freeway today. They're right next to the cliffs. They're doing this stuff in inclement weather, trying to get this stuff done, and they had to stop work quite often to complete the blinkers that you're going to see and the beacons that you're going to see in the door. But eventually, Portland, Spokane route, Ham route 5 was completed in 1930, and this is the structure that you see countrywide. So the mail is getting around. The mail is just moving around by air quite well by now. Here's an actual chart, a sectional chart that we're familiar with if we are pilots. This is a 1933 version 
that I stumbled across into a collector, and it actually shows the beacons, the blinkers, and the root structure starting from Portland, actually Swan Island in the day, before Portland Airport became alive. Portland Airport, PDX as we know it, uh, became alive in 1940. The Swan Island was the airport. In fact, Swan Island was developed to be an airport, and it actually built up that road that goes up the hill, and all that was for the airport structure to move the mail and to start a passenger terminal service back in the day. If you want to break away from that and go into a separate file, Carla, we're going to show you close-up pictures of some of the, the the keys that we needed and did have in the sectionals. This unit here is Rocky Butte. And the number started at number zero for the start of the Portland Spokane route. Swan Island being here, the beginning of the route, go up and intercept the Rocky Butte light and head up the trunk mill, beacon number one. Follow some of the entry beacons into the gorge, left the red Cape Horn bridal veil to beacon number two in the bridal veil area and head on up the gorge, following these blinkers and beacons that made this sort of runway looking structure at night. So you could follow it through there at night. There were little blinker lights on the Oregon side in red and green lights on the Washington side coupled with the rotating beacons and it created this runway looking environment all the way up the gorge that kept the pilot safe when the weather was too low. You can pull back to the what presentation. What altitude would they be flying? Pardon? What altitude would they be flying? In good weather anything they really wanted you know i travel through here in a piper cup type thing and, you know 2000 2500 feet 1500 feet whatever is comfortable for the day if it's too windy down here in the gorge like around cascade locks it's sometimes better to get higher if the weather's low if you got a thunderstorm coming through or fog you got to get down there on the deck sometimes i've flown in the gorge before where it's weather right down to the river and you can't see anything and if you're lucky, you can go to one side of the gorge and get through and watch the cell go through on the other side. But it's a nasty place to fly. And if you make a mistake, you've got granite, water, or granite to work with. So this is the basic structure of the beginning of the Portland-Spokane Air Route, Contract Air Mail Route number 5, starting in Portland, Swan Island, working its way up through the Dells, this being the most tricky part to get through the Cascade Range, as the Cascade Range is normally flown over at 8,000 feet through all sorts of inclement weather. If you've reviewed or been around the uh, Model 40 Boeing in the back of Addison Pemberton, that airplane's got flying wires on it and struts, and if you fly through any kind of ice or snow, it's going to collect on the airplane quickly, and it's not going to want to fly very well, if at all. It's Biplane time in the, in the climate weather is not a good thing. These kinds of airplanes with struts and wires collect ice instantly. They will not shed quickly. They quit flying very soon. Here's the actual structure from Google. Swan Island, soon to be Portland Airport, 1940. Rocky View to start, number, number zero. Never seen any structure that started with a zero like that. Up to Troutdale, Cape Horn, and the auxiliary power shaft. We'll talk about that later. Gene, who's in the audience, helped us find that power shaft, gave us a tip one day, and that power shaft still exists. We'll talk about what that means. As you move up the river, you see the, the points where the blinkers were and the beacons. There's no separating those right now, but you can see how many are there creating this runway type environment going up the river. Next page is subsequently up the river we go, getting close to Beacon Rock, Eagle Creek area, the dam, which, by the way, if you don't recall, the Bonneville Dam started in 1933, when a lot of this was going on. Wasn't completed until 1937. So all this stuff was going on underneath it as they're going through here. And they're getting up into here to uh, 
Anderson Point, which is where this beacon outside, number four, was located. About 400 feet off the deck, right on an edge of a cliff. And we've, uh, I've actually been up there, and it's quite a climb. It's nearly vertical just to get up there. Around the corner, we thought that this corner here, if you've flown the gorge at all, this is a pretty good turn in here, whereas Hood River, there's a beacon right here, I haven't got a mark on this chart here, the Hood River beacon was right above the gravel pit, but you cannot see from that beacon to beacon four, which is over here. So we always thought maybe they should have beat, put a beacon right on top of this little table, which, which sit right there, but they just decided they didn't want to do it. Would have been a good place for it. No number five, it goes from beacon four to beacon six A, and up to Mosier to beacon six B. On it goes. So they didn't put a number five in there, but we think it should have gone right there. Just guessing. Around the corner we go, we're heading up to Mosier. Mosier here at the top of the little rise, the two points for entry, and then the Dallas Airport area. This uh, actual beacon area, you can drive right up to it. There's a pad still there. There's no beacon there, but there's a pad sort of hidden by blue blackberry bushes right there. Drive right up next to it, take a look at it. Not that hard to find. The other one is the Dallas, one of the first ones around the airport. I'm at the home park right now. Nothing to see there. And on it goes up to Spokane, via Pasco, and all the way on up where the train <coughs> cheat is a lot. This is an actual late 20s navigational chart that the pilots would have and review to get you through the gorge and on out to Spokane. Everything on the left side is pretty much the first part we just talked about from Swan Island up to the turn to the Dallas. We're going to come in and blow this up because the details of this are pretty important. Showing you the, the tunnel action that was created by putting those lights up in the door there. We're going to roll in on this little tire. As you can see, all these red blinkers on the right and green blinkers on the left create this runway type action going through the gorge to give you some guidance along with the rotating beacons of 3A which is the beacon rock one just there on Wano Lake I'm not sure if that's pronounced right just above uh, the Cascade Lock Bridge the actual Cascade Lock or Anderson Point beacon number four those three beacons will get you through some of that hairy windy area on up the Hood River this chart makes it look really straight. It's not so straight in real life. When you're flying around some of these big mountains, there's a big turn up in there, and it doesn't really look like it there. Rather than, again, fly over the top and get full of ice and snow, they had a way to get through the Cascade Range by flying through the gorge. It was a lot safer overall. The weather was a lot better overall. But as you folks know, if you've been around it, it can get very windy, very turbulent, very icy, very snowy, very quickly. But it's still better than going over the top every time. This is quite a piece, a rare piece of a rare find. I'm glad to have it. It's not available anywhere else. It came out of one of the late 1929 articles on what's been happening in the airmail business. Looking east uh, on the Columbia River, up the gorge, and it's point, beacon number four, again about 400 feet up the deck, Wind Mountain. Some of the structure that goes around the corner, you cannot see any of the lights until you get around the corner. So it's important to know with that chart that you have in your hand, what's going to come up next and why you should stay within the guidance that it's giving you. This is the actual receiving of the first airmail back in Spokane up at Phillips Field in an airplane just like the one in the back of the room, a Boeing model. 1932. It took them that long after we completed the gorge in 1930, late 1932, we flew for almost a year before we could get that structure completed all the way up to Spokane. This is what it looks like. And it's not necessarily what it looks like in every position. In the gorge, due to terrain, geography, cliffs, you don't necessarily have the generator shack, the tower, and a directional order of the arrow to at every position. 
each one of these being electronic in this area. We're powered by a generator or two, gas powered. And they had to have the supply. These generator shacks generally had two generators in them. They varied between 1,500 watts to 2,000 watts and powered these lights directly. The shacks initially were of chrome yellow and black. They would have the root structure. In our case, it would be P slash S for Portland Spokane. And the mileage away from the beginning point, 41 miles in that case. Or in our case, we used rounded numbers, number four from the beginning. It wasn't really a mileage point in the Portland Spokane area. You'd find a lot of this stuff down in the southern states where you had a lot of flat, open, drier terrain. Scott, who's done in Arizona, probably saw a lot of these arrows. New Mexico, Arizona. I actually didn't see a lot of the arrows. It was just primarily the uh, towers and the, uh, the uh, power shots. Okay. Saw a lot. Salt Lake had a lot of arrows in the Utah area. There's some in New Mexico. We didn't get, there were none on this route. We just didn't have the need. On the eastern side of the mountains, the route was such that it was uh, clear enough and the distance was easy to see that we didn't need arrows pointing to the next one. You could see it on most nights. Here's a breakdown again of the actual structure. Generator shack. I have uh, little handout sheets of uh, what the dimensions were of the day and uh, how precise they were. That would turn the motors on, the generators on. When the sun went down, the sun sensor would turn this generator on. It would run all night. When the sun came up, the sun sensor turned itself off. So you didn't need manpower out there at all. Southern states with no power, no grids, and a long ways away from anything, quite often they were acetylene power. So that they would have tanks of acetylene inside these shafts instead of generators. And they would run off of that, off of some sort of pilot. Load. The arrows would point in the direction that you should be flying next. At the top of the beacon, you would see what the side lights like you had on the side of the uh, beacon up on this one outside. Course lights, which would direct you, usually by sending you in a different direction, on which way the course is going to go next. You could see those at night. And quite often, they would pump out the number of where you were through Morse code. Course lights would pump an ID out. In this case, it's the number four. And you'd fly by going, oh, I'm at the number four, and I'm supposed to go that way. I turn that way. You could see the light beam going out that way, and you would go that way. Here's some of the arrows in a shack. You see the pins, what I call pins, support pins, where the beacon's structure would actually bolt to. And that's a lot of what I find when I'm doing my hiking up into the hills, finding these places for the little, the 20-foot blinker towers. They have smaller little pins because they're not as big. These great big tall 10-footers, 10 10-foot 10 wide, are for the actual rotating beacon position. This is the Utah area here. Here's a beautiful reproduction in New Mexico. Restoration of a beautiful shaft, arrow, light beacon. And the IDECO company would stamp these parts out of galvanized steel, coated part numbers. Anybody could bolt them together like an erector set. They come in 20-foot tower sizes used in the deserts and the plains also here in the gorge, a lot of the 20-footers, for the blinking lights, the auxiliary lights. And they go as high as 87 feet, and up in Montana now they're, what, 91 in one or two cases. Just because of the terrain, so that you can see it down line or coming from another side. Our standard tower, 51 feet high. That would be standard. That's what this one is that you're looking at. That's what we have here, 51 feet high. Side view of the same tower, just a gorgeous restoration, well done. The thing to note is that the initial colors when these first went up, were chrome yellow 
are all the oranges and black. Sort of a set, semi-gloss. And about a year later, they changed it to international orange and white. But every place I've been still has chrome yellow on the pins. On every part I've seen, it's got remnants of chrome yellow on it. It definitely was chrome yellow on all these parts when they first were put up there. And it, it's good paint. If you want some good paint, you can apply that stuff. Good stuff. It doesn't come off of anything. It's still there. Here's a picture of our very own Hood River on private property back in the day. It's overlooking or just on top of the gravel pit just east of the bridge. If you were to go up over this knoll here, the bridge is just right over there. If you know where it's at, it's easy to see these days. Don't know how long it's been down, but uh, that's an actual picture of the Hood River. 6A is what they call that particular beacon. If you look down river, you can't see around the corner down there where Beacon 4 was. I still think Beacon 5 should have been down there somewhere, but no joy. Here's a generator shack. The two upper pictures are actual generators of the day. One being painted with the GP or CP, I can't even be sure here. But that's the core structure line. The actual 515 gallon fuel tanks and two generators inside. Quite a few years ago, Gene told us about a shack, a generator shack that he thought he knew. And that's what it looks like on the side of the freeway, eastbound Highway 84. Is it the Lesher Farm? Lesher. Lesher Dairy Farm. Lesher Dairy Farm, which is a historic monument built in the 1800s, right off the freeway. It's still there, owned by some really nice folks. Well, mile post 29. Yeah. Yep. And the blackberry bush has been cut away, and the yard's been cleaned up a lot. But that's it from the freeway, that's it from the yard, way down in the, in the distance there. That's an actual shack still remaining in the gorge that powered a blinker just off to the right and a beacon just out on Rista Rock, out of the island out there, which was out there for a long, long time. So that little it is, uh, what's the mile post again, Gene? 29. 29. Right, right, right around 29. Right, right over yeah, it is right, right over there. Yeah. It's right by the railroad tracks. Exactly. It's literally next door to the railroad tracks. And uh, if, if one of you is driving and one of you is looking, you'll find it. Good, good. <laughs> Preferably the driver drives, look or look. Here's a uh, couple of shots of the actual generator shacks being built up. The fuel tanks are already in place. If you look closely and hard, there are two generators and the one on the right. They're hard to see in that picture, but they're there. Let's see a couple of shadows of the generator. That looks just like this. We have one in the hangar uh, H3 that I donated to the... Uh, I found one finally. It was one of the hardest things I ever found in this research. I kept looking for generators and generators and light generators and generators. And came up with nothing for about a year and a half. As soon as I saw this automatic electric plant, and I did a Google search on electric plants, that picture came up immediately. So did this ad. Kohler of Kohler, with that White House picture in it, and an airplane, as well, I paid her here. I finally found what I was looking for after a year and a half. Then I had to go find one, and I found one here in the Northwest, over around North Vancouver area. Private seller, a guy who collected a lot of stuff, had one that came off a Navy ship that was used for powering the radio sets. So it's Navy gray, every bit of it's Navy gray, but that doesn't matter about the color. And it's sitting over there in a hangar, and it needs to be restored, and put together with this beacon so we could start lighting it someday. So it does that, if you like the picture. It's the actual one that we need. It's exactly what they used on site on all these places. And it's good to have one here at the museum. So there's the beauty of it right there. It's original picture, original uh, spec. Yep. 
either hand crank or the sun sensor cranks it up. Chris, I've got a question. Can we get that shaft down here up by milepost 29? I talked about that to the past owner, yeah. and um, he he pulled back on wanting to do that. He he told the new owner we would be there someday, knocking on the door, and uh, we thought about it. We talked about it a lot. Yeah. It's an easy duplication. I mean, having the shack is one thing, but it's just tin, and you can buy this tin anywhere. I think I think it'd be easier to, to replicate it than to move it because mm -hmm. the floor is pretty rotten. It's rotten. The cows used to go in there and have coffee every morning. Yeah, it's just good. Good. <laughs> so okay. there's really no point to it. And it's tin's cheap, and you paint it up just the way it was here. Put it together here, and it would be the same thing. Same thing they did. I'd almost rather keep it there anyway, because that whole place is an historic location. It's registered historic. The Lysha Farm is way up on the list for for history buffs around here. So I'd rather almost leave it there. Little side note: during the day, when the maintenance guys have to come by and check these shacks and check the beacons for bad lights and all that stuff, they quite often have the people who own the property where these things used to be like at the Lysha Forum, they would pay them $10 a month to help maintain them. So they didn't have to drop by. It's, I don't know if I want to, you know how the weather is in the gorge, I don't know if I want to be crawling up these 51-foot towers on these cliffs, changing a light bulb, making it up. So if some guy, I could pay, if the government paid me 10 bucks a month was a lot of money back in the 20s and 30s, I'd take that money to go out to the falls in my own property. Here's one of the, what I call the big deal in the gorge, are these side force lights, blinkers, what, auxiliary lights, who blink, whatever you want to call them. These are the guides. The one on the left is something you'd find out in the southwest. It is a settlement power in the day. This is an equipment shack at the bottom. This one also, being a settler, would have these settling tanks in that shack. A sun sensor to get it started. Course lights, those big round discs, are course lights sending you in the direction you need to go in. And an actual blinking light at the top, which is quite a bit different than our 33 millimeter ones that we would have in this area here. 330, 330. The picture on the right is actually from our gorge. It's beacon blinker number 48R, which stands for a red light. If it was on the other side of the river, it would be a 48G for Greenland. But this one, that's exactly what that site looks like. I've been to this site. It's right above the freeway. It's easy to see it where if you know where it is. What does the 48 mean? Mileage from the beginning point. 48 miles from the actual beginning point of Swan Island, or probably Rocky Butte in this case, position zero. But you go up to that point right now, today, there's these little spikes. There's still some plywood, and it's not ply, but it's wood that that house was made out of, that little equipment shop. It's still yellow in color. You get yellow all over everything. And hardly any red on it, but it's yellow and black. So and what is this close to? This is virtually not close to anything. It's 48 miles from the corner. Um, I can show you on another chart, maybe, that might help you, but... Um, it's, when you're heading eastbound on 84 towards here, you're going to see kind of a concrete retaining wall. There's a couple of them. It's, it's above that. It's, it's beyond Wyeth. Okay. Yes. A mile or two miles. Shell Rock Mountain. Yeah. Well, it's actually at the bottom of it. The bottom of Shell Rock. Yeah. And I found it by going up to Shell Mountain little road that the maintenance guys go up to the big wires. Yeah. And I hiked from the bottom of Shell Mountain, right side, a mile to this site, because I didn't know exactly where it was at. I had a little GPS and lap logs. And so I walked across Shell Mountain, and I learned a lesson that all the mossy areas are like walking a carpet, and the rock, all it wants to do is move. It's very dangerous. Here's a rarity. This is our beacon here at Beacon 4 outside. This is one of the rarest 
types of beacons in the business. The beacons you see most of the time are like that or similar in enclosed cases. Ours has got this spaceship, space lid dome on it that's clear. It went obsolete very early in the system. We contacted, in our research, Krauss Hines. And we, when we talked to the guy at Krauss Hines, he goes, I never even knew this existed. He went digging into his manuals and found this actual piece and actually wrote down the words, it's obsolete. We don't we haven't made that for years. And it just surprised him to no end that that even existed today. He didn't, never even knew they made it. And he worked on it. This beacon is extremely rare. And there's, uh, I don't know how many of the beacons in Montana that are still alive that are using the dome. Only the one that has a dome. And due to vandalism, people shooting at them, putting holes in them and breaking them, they've had to replace that beautiful dome three times, four times. And they've had to use plexiglass, so the glass that is blown here, blown out, is gone. All we have is real glass blown cover. I know of one other that exists. It's in private hands up in Sultan in a storage trailer. And it's as good a condition as this, but it's being protected from the weather. So there's two of these that I know of in my site that I've seen. And then there's the one at, uh, in Montana that's still, still being used today. And they still light the Montana, five of those, in Montana daily because the pilots in the small aircraft still want them to be used. They want that level of safety for night flying, inclement weather. And in Montana, that's a great idea. So we're lucky to have this. We're lucky to have the rarity. We'd like to see this restored here at WAM in its entirety in perfect condition, and I think there's a lot of life left in it, both in the generator and the actual beacon structure itself. It's not that far away. In prior to 1982, there was a gentleman who flew his Ford trimotor up and down the gorge for business, who knows what all. One of his employees recalls that that gentleman in, used to say, Note that that beacon was alive until when it was decommissioned in 1965. They ran it every day until July 1965. Then shut it down. And so in commemoration of the other guy that had been flying through the gorge all the time in business in the Ford, they decided to get it hooked up with the museum down in Hood River at the uh, Riverside, the county museum. So he coordinated that with the uh, people who own the Boeing Burkhall here at CH-46. The McDonnell Douglas Hughes 500 was from KATU Channel 2 News, and they filmed the entire thing back in 1982. And during the flooding that they had at the studio, I contacted them and I said, I'd like to have a copy of this. Well, during the flooding, they lost all this good archive along with some other good stuff. So we lost some pretty good footage here. This would have been really fun to have today. So they sent a team up there. They got it uh, unbolted or they cut it. I'm not sure how they did it up there. They got this helicopter up there and hooked it all up. And we can change slides to this movement of where they actually slung it. And you'll notice they didn't protect the glass dome or anything. <laughs> They just shipped it, brought it right into the Hood River County Museum, and under a heavy wa wa rotor loads and rotor wash, they secured this thing to the ground, and that's where it stood until July of 2009. Terry Brand had been negotiating with this museum down by the river to get this tower moved up here, and I put a team together with Carla to coordinate and move and pickle this thing and get it moved up here. And we did that in one day. And well, we had a couple of preview days to get it pickled and get it ready to go. We protected the glass in this case. And I got it going. And this is some of the procedure. We had a, a team with a small crane, certainly not a helicopter this day, 
small crane for doing signage. And we got her all ready to go. Got her ready to get hooked up. And we started cutting it. This is Brian Brandt doing his cutting methods. Got her laying down and Bones Construction, a little of hand of applause for them, the same group that helped me get these doors up here for this museum, came up and helped me get the tower without asking for a dime. They were great people, they did a good job. They didn't hurt anything and they did it uh, just free gratis both times and we love it. So it went well both times. They trucked that baby right up here to the new museum up by the airport here where the pad has been laid by Terry before this place was ever finished. He knew he wanted that tower. He negotiated properly. We brought it up here. We got it laid up here and welded to the pad and it's hopefully here forever. That's the way she stands today. We want to get her restored. We want her restored to a point where we don't hang anything on them. We don't want anything about museum artifacts around it. I, I just think it's a great piece to have. We would like to get a shack up here, get the generator restored. Uh, during the fly we'd like to get this thing turned on in the evenings when we have our dinner party. And let it let it make the neighbors mad for a few minutes every night during the fly. <laughs> so, I think it'd be a great thing to do. We we could use some help. We could use anybody that's interested in getting involved in cleaning, painting, electricians to help the generator go, that kind of thing. But uh, that's basically what this is all about. Is, uh, this piece here and what the guys went through with the advent of uh, better aircraft like the Boeing 247, the DC-3, and the instrumentation that went with it, they could fly higher, faster, more loads, better instrumentation so they wouldn't hit anything. And this whole system basically slowly died away. And we moved on to glass cockpits and the mail is still getting carried by aircraft and there's a lot of this. So. If you have any questions, I appreciate you listening, and uh, thanks for your attention a lot, and you're welcome to grab any of the flyers and ask me any questions you want. So, thank you very much. Are they on the navigation chart? They are, and they're very simply laid out. Uh, a good example would be just down dam of Bonneville <laughs> I took a look uh, back by the Bonneville the city. There's Aaron a little Stanford X. In his yeah, chair. There, there were two nope. that I remember. Is the, is the uh, um, uh, um, gravel pit the one that the county keeps its uh, <laughs> equipment in? Well, I lived right there. And there was a landing strip right in front of us there. And there was a landing strip that's covered with water now, right by the big rock before you get to Cascade Lock. It was out in the river on a sandbar. I'd like to talk to you. And, uh, <laughs> well, as a little kid, I was, you know, I was seven years old, six, seven years old when they put this in. And it was just great, you know, they'd fly along the lights of light. It was, it was quite a lot for, a, you know, there wasn't much going was on. Was that it? With that discussion, this is really important to me. Um, we aren't really talking about this a lot because we don't have a lot of proof. Which would you There's like many. to on the sectional? I would like to ask you one. The small one. This is what the gentleman is talking about. This, our beacon, technically, what I showed you earlier, is right here. And, that, and this map shows, in this chart, shows a blinker in 1933. And the beacon was down on the river on an intermediate airfield that he was talking about where they would land. So the, the, blink, the, the actual beacon was there on the field or was it on the hill? I have a little, I'm a little fuzzy on that at that at 32 is where it was. The airfield was there. It was used. I saw people land on it. And uh, this is before they dredged, ladies and gentlemen. If you're familiar with Cascade Locks, they have that dredging area where they put all these locks. Well, this is before. If you look at this chart, all this is gone, and they got these finger dredges in here now, and this airport's basically water right in here now. It's all water. And I have a later chart that shows this beacon, this rotating beacon, which is this big star with a hole in the middle and these four sides. This has been moved up to here, which means they moved it to the top of the hill. 
the dam filled up in 38, and they may have decided to move it to because I don't think they were running the airplanes up to 38. No. Uh, 37. I don't remember the stop. I just remember. Well, you're, you're I remember right how the exciting boat. it was. <laughs> As, and you got a great memory for being seven at the time. Yeah. Well, we were right there. I, I saw an auto gyro when I was you know, five years old when I was in our house. But this is the stuff we're running into in our research. We run into a situation where we don't have proof, we don't have knowledge, and we have a myriad of questions for every discovery. And I looked at this one day and went, look at this. So they moved this thing. Because that is not the location of the Beacon 4. The Beacon 4 was up on the hill for all we knew. But you are you are confirming to some of my thoughts that it was actually down in that intermediate field where those planes were landed. It was a pretty active spot at one time, wow. as I recall. It's been a long time. Well, talk, talk about the more or less AFD write-up. Yeah, we didn't bring that, but there was an early, in 1938, and they probably had it out earlier than that. For those of you who are pilots, there are airport facilities directories, a little green <coughs> book that describes all airports in your vicinity on the runway, the environment of the runway, what facilities are available, those kinds of things. And they had those during the day, but they had them in descriptors that said, well, the, it had a rotating beacon so many feet away or south of the tracks or east or whatever. They had descriptors of where this stuff was on the field. This one was described as, there's a blinker right here, it said the beacon was 650 feet to the west of that blinker, that blinker there. The actual AFD said it's 650 feet to the west and on the on the north side of the tracks, the railroad tracks. And it actually said those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's our beacon. So that was on the field that you remember. Well, I think, <clears throat> because the wind was coming from the west, you usually have to land into it. So it they come around the corner, put it right down, it's probably the turn it. The yeah. Step on a limb just yet, yeah, but we can surmise the actual beacon's been moved four times. This actual beacon. Well, it was always amazing. I didn't know what they used the beacon for when they moved it uh, later on. As I got, got older, I why why was that beacon up there? Yeah. It didn't seem to have, add anything. <laughs> 